video for the commission meeting. to call the May 16th 2017 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order thank you all for being with us this evening <clears throat> our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance and I'd like to ask the members of Boy Scouts of America Troop 61 to please come forward and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening we're very glad to have you with us so um, guys come on up And I'll ask everyone else to please rise and join in the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, would you like would you like to um, just uh, introduce yourself at the microphone over here at the podium? Please uh, let us know which troop you're from and uh, just uh, your names. And who's the who's the big who's the big kid with yeah. you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, who's the big kid? Um, I'm Carl Giddings. I'm from Troop 61. I'm Ryan Chong. I'm from Troop 61. I'm Ethan Walls, and I'm from Troop 61. I'm Arden Giddings from Troop 61. All right, gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Let's give them a round of applause. Between now and our next county commissioner meeting, our country will <coughs> celebrate Memorial Day on May 29th. So I'd like to ask that we begin our meeting with a moment of silence to reflect on the sacrifices of those who have served our country and given the ultimate sacrifice of their lives in the service and protection of our country. Thank you. I will now read the uh, ethics reminder to the Board of Commissioners, uh, which is simply asking if there is any item on the agenda, the County Commission agenda this evening, the outcome of which will have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board members. And does any board member have a financial <coughs> interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on all matters coming before the board this evening. We'll now move on to public comment. The time limit for individual public comment at our board meeting this evening is three minutes. If your time expires, you may leave a question along with your name, address, and phone number with the county manager. Board members are not expected to comment on any matters during the public comment period. This is your time to speak to us. The board reserves the right to deny public address on any subject that's been previously presented to the board during the same meeting. 
Um, just one note, in addition to the public comment period now, we also expect to have public comment on the um, Economic Development Coalition public hearing. We also expect to vote on the memorandum of understanding this evening, so we'll take public comment on that if there is a motion. Are there any members who would like to speak during the board at this time? Uh, yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Marsha Bromberg, and I'm president of Friends of Connect Buncombe, a Greenway advocacy group. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Greenways. There are many things I could say about Greenways, many positive things, but I'm a retired finance person, so I'm going to put on my finance hat and talk to you about Greenways as an investment. Uh, Greenways have a return when you invest dollars in them. They're not a sunk cost. I've read one study that said that Greenways re uh, returned 3 to 1. Another study that said that Greenways returned 9 to 1. I don't know what's correct, but I do know that when you plant a Greenway, it brings businesses to a community. It brings businesses that want to locate near those Greenways, and it brings new businesses that want that kind of amenity for their employees and for themselves. And when you plant a Greenway, it increases real estate values. One real estate agent in t uh, Tennessee said she thought it added as much as ten to $25,000 to a value of a house to be near a Greenway. And developers like to place their developments near Greenways as well. As well. They understand from another study that uh, Greenways are the second most requested amenity for new home buyers. And Greenways, as Commissioner Belcher mentioned before, extend that park concept that he is so high on way out into the community because community because greenways in, are in their own way linear parks so if you want families and people of all ages and all types and all economic levels to get out and have an opportunity to recreate greenways is the way to do it and when they do that when they walk or run or jog or ride their bikes they become healthier and when they become healthier, they become less of a public health burden on the community, a way to save money. And finally, greenways attract visitors, which may be why TDA is willing to give funds for greenways. Um, I like to go down and ride my bike in South Carolina on the Swamp Rabbit Trail, and I think some of the other commission, some of the commissioners here have done so as well. But why am I going to South Carolina and spending my money there when people in South Carolina should be coming to Buncombe County to ride our greenways along the French Broad and Swannanoa rivers and spend their dollars in our community. So again, greenways are an investment. So when you're considering your budget, don't think that you're just giving money away for something that's nice, although it is nice for members of our community. But think of the investment you're making. And I urge you to include greenways as you consider your budget con uh, considerations for 2018 and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Since you're going to be voting on the memorandum today, I better give this out now. <coughs> I would like to ask you, see, Commissioner Glancet, since you're in negotiation, Josh, you need to see it too. I have reminiscent of transmapping. Anybody here remember transmapping? Contract the county side to have pictures of the house on the internet. <coughs> the contract didn't have a termination clause in it. And now Google has those pictures for free. I would give you one, but I don't think you all will be signed today, so it don't make any difference. But I would like to have these questions answered. And I see you started my time while I was walking around distributing that. So basically, let's summarize real quickly. I went through this memorandum of agreement, and I find that we have a situation where we can transmit information in a secure data room. That's sure going to have the public informed. We also are going to have a third party contract involved, and that third party compact does can say cannot be asked about their trade secrets or proprietary information. So they can say anything's proprietary, and we can't get it. It also says that Duke Energy is going to provide an attorney if anybody sues to get open records. Why have you got to build that wall? We don't want Trump to build a wall between us and Mexico, but here you're going to build a wall around this memorandum and around this business deal that the citizens can't penetrate. 
Next question, are the solar panels going to come from China? We just had a major company in England go bankrupt because they did not get grant money. And we know that solar panels are beneficial simply because of tax write-offs. When Duke Power gets a tax write-off, who has to pay those taxes? The average working man. Now, if Duke Power goes down there and we decide we want to sue for information and they have to hire an attorney, who pays that? The taxpayer, the middle class. They get hit from both sides. It leaves citizens hanging out in the dry. Why aren't the details of the final arrangement going to be made available and done in public? And the most amazing thing to me at all is that this memorandum of agreement will have to follow the laws of South Carolina. And folks, I have it right here. Department of Secretary of the State, Limited Liability Corporation, which means they're only limited for the responsibility, is a North Carolina corporation, not even listed in South Carolina, but we're going to follow South Carolina in that memorandum. I'm looking at you new commissioners. I suggest you delay the vote on this to those questions that I presented to you that's taken about four hours to go through and compare are answered. So uh, I know I said normally we're not going to respond, but I do want to just make one comment. Uh, Mr. Yelton, can I give you something, um, Mr. Yelton? There has been, uh, just since you brought it up, I just want to give this to you now since you're interested in this. There has been uh, one proposed change to the memorandum of understanding, and uh, your, your friends at the Asheville Citizen Times had some of the same questions. And so we'll talk about it when we get to it. But, uh, we'll just keep it, and then and you can address it. And Wanda can address me and answer after the meeting how you address them. Okay. All right, sure thing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Very welcome. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, sure. Tim, you want to speak next? Good evening, County Commissioners. I'm Timothy Sadler, and I wanted to actually follow up on a couple of comments that I've given in the last couple of meetings, or a few meetings. And, um, uh, well, at the last meeting, um, I had um, requested um, any assistance um, from the commissioners on <clears throat> an issue related to Veterans Affairs. And I wanted to thank uh, the county for um, the the support that was uh, provided. We had a meeting, Alice and I, with uh, Fletcher Tove, who's new to the county, and I think going to do an excellent job. Um, and I actually did not hear Commissioner Belcher's comment after I spoke in that meeting, um, suggesting that we might work with a, a Congress congressman's office. And I'm, I'm hoping to see that process uh, take place. Um, and Fletcher is aware of that. Um, so I wanted to, to thank the commission uh, for that. And also, uh, regarding my comment of um, potentially being more efficient with how we spend our money to address opioids, I wanted to thank Commissioner Fryer for kind of crystallizing the ignorance uh, that we're up against. Um, you had, in the Mountain Express article, stated that, you, that you're against all drugs. I, I, I'm here to ask if you've had a Tylenol or if you've ever had a prescription medication from the pharmaceutical companies or maybe a family member, Commissioner Fryer, uh, we'd like some clarification there, the community. Um, this is uh, an issue about spending our money more wisely and supporting local entrepreneurship and business development, not global companies, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical brands that I would have to imagine you've participated in on some level. So I just am really here to draw everybody's attention to this Mountain Express article that did come out a couple of weeks after I gave my comment, and um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Mr. Rice.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm going to address you as young whippersnappers. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, I like I Young like whippersnappers. Uh, it's a benefit to be around as many years as I have around this place. And you, young whippersnappers, can learn a lot. And you should have. Today's meeting should, workshop, should have opened your eyes. <clears throat> but I saw something that disturbs me. I saw a political line being drawn in the sand today. I hope that you all work together for this budget process and work together to lower this tax rate on the burden of the people in Buncombe County. This is the greatest time we'll ever have to lower the tax rate substantially. And if we don't do it now, the opportunity is not going to be for a while. The taxpayers have suffered enough. Let me tell you, we come from the 12 worst school district in the, what, the state or United States? You've heard that story. To the 50 most precious schools and the best that you've ever seen. But what has happened? 18,000 kids have left our system. And we don't have but 24,000 and some left. Now, if we're going to maintain $28 million <coughs> in the budget for two years to repair these 50 schools and we've got kids leaving and by the droves, then what are we going to do with the buildings? I suggest that we look into charter schools and other homeschoolers and find out how we can coordinate some of this stuff with them to use these buildings and use our resources in a way, if they need to pay, okay. But at least, let's maintain our buildings and use these things efficiently as possible. The fund balance at Buncombe County School, $12 million. And Yuns ain't no secret to what has been going on over there because it's been coming in for years. We need to take that $12 million, bring it back into our general fund, and lower the tax rate where we need to lower it for the people. This year, not next year. Buncombe County is rolling in money. It's time to pay the taxpayers back at least a little bit here. And I hope politics don't play into this budget this year like I think I saw a while ago even. Body language, your body language tells more than what you say on your lip. And let me tell you, when it comes down to 4-3 vote, you're going to say, oh, Jerry was right. I hope it don't come to that. I hope you have sense enough to agree on getting the taxpayers some relief. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, uh, let's move on to the consent agenda. And I think the first thing is just there was a question about the uh, TDA <coughs> yeah, password uh, yeah. administration. Yeah, I just think it's good so people hear the numbers. So yeah, so what you're seeing on that uh, budget amendment is really all we're doing is just reclassifying it. We're just doing, it's an accounting transaction. So that is for the occupancy tax fund, <clears throat> excuse me. So all we're really doing is projecting the revenues, um, those, those occupancy tax revenues pass through the county to the TDA. And so we're just ensuring that we have enough budget there uh, to cover that. What we did, I think in previous uh, budget amendments, we just had it misclassified as um, as transfers when really and truly we should be doing it as economic development. Um, so it's just, it's the net effect. It's just a, a bookkeeping transaction. So I'm trying to pull it up. Uh, how, how much, how much it, was it? Just it so is, that, just so uh, the amount's on the record. It was 15 20. million. Yeah. yeah. So the total, uh, I'm trying to pull it up. Yeah. The, total amount of, of that is $15.7 million, uh, which is just the, the from the transfers. Now we're just going to classify it as revenue. Uh, there's the administrative fee piece of that, which is $238,000, which is really the piece that the county charges for the collection of those uh, revenues. And then the $6.6 .6 million of that is just contingency because we always sort of have to, I don't know, for lack of a better word, spitball with that 
um, those hotel collections are going are going to be so so a total of 22 million five hundred and yes okay yes that's the and, and that again that is that is just for our budgeting purposes what we're trying to do with that is again it's not the TDA we're not estimating TDA revenues per se um, that really is sort of done by the TDA side we're just trying to make sure that we have enough budget in place that we don't um, get a, a budget uh, a non-compliance uh, when it comes to doing the financial statements at the end of the year so we just uh, we, we sort of aim high making sure that um, there's sufficient budget to cover those revenues that are coming in. So could you I explain the hotel tax in so right like so the, or less. so occupancy tax is a six percent uh, hotel tax that we have on our uh, overnight stays with hotels and so uh, we as the county the hotels will pay that uh, tax to us it is uh, in our occupancy tax fund and then we turn around and distribute that money straight to the tourism development authority um, and by contract we keep a collection um, fee uh, for doing all with all the collections and the, the financial transactions of that and three three-fourths of that fund goes into marketing and uh, a quarter of it goes into a, right so a, for the, uh, for, capital for, fund right so for the use of that three-fourths of those revenues uh, go uh, for the marketing of tourism in the area uh, I think as, as they put it that is putting heads in beds is what their ultimate goal is and the other quarter 25 percent of those revenues go to their product uh, what is it product development fund um, which is uh, going for capital projects that will encourage tourism um, in the area and I think recently within the last was it last couple of years they've they've changed sort of the, the guidelines for those product develop, development funds I think they can well, that's controlled by statute so the right. the state has changed yeah. yes okay thanks that was all thank you right. thank you <clears throat> all right is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and follow the agenda as published so moved Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. All in uh, further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, next up is recognition of the Buncombe County Special Olympics. And Josh O'Connor and his staff are <coughs> with us to talk to us about this great event that just took place in our community. So I feel like y'all have probably heard enough from me today. So I actually brought um, some of our athletes along to um, explain a little bit about the program. Right. And the athletes that we have here in the, the first two rows um, not only competed in our annual spring games, which brings about 500 athletes and 1,000 volunteers collectively uh, to T.C. Robertson every year, but they're also members of our year-round uh, training program. So I'm going to ask them to come up with, along with Lynn, who's hiding back there, um, <laughs> and share a couple words with you. Awesome. Good evening, um, Commissioners. My name is Robert Powell, and I have been with Special Olympics for 38 years. Mm. And I'm glad that we have opportunities other than high school. If it wasn't for Special Olympics, we wouldn't be here right now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, hey guys. Hey. Okay, uh, my name is Matt Pelletti. I am 28 years old. I heard to discuss about Special Olympics. I've been Special Olympics over 20 years. And I've been, I am happy and love Josh, uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we do too. We do. My name is Anthony Martinez. I've been, I'm 28 years old. I have North Carolina, Buncombe County Special Olympics. I spent, high, in high school, I did not know that Special Olympics could go after high school. Now, uh, it gives me power to go special in things 
that I would not have overcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. It's <laughs> fine. Justin, come on. Oh, shoot. Um, this is my first time ever speaking in front of a public audience with uh, the commissioners in front of me here. Some of them will be a little nervous and a little scared at the same time. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, we get that. But uh, I just want to thank Stephen's mom for for all that she has done with these guys. And I'm just glad to be a part of it as anything else. But on top of all that, the fire chiefs, the policemen, I want to thank them guys. Because them guys, the fire chiefs have the same job as my dad did. Mm. But my dad's no longer a fire, well, he's a retired firefighter, that is, but he's retired. But as I just want to thank the policemen and the firefighters for what they do, for putting their lives on the line for this country as well. And I think they deserve more of a hand than me, <laughs> because they do an, I mean, they. I mean, they do a grateful job. So I uh, appreciate them as much. But thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Carla's going to line them up and get a picture of everybody real Great. fast. But thank you for having us here tonight. I'd thank also you, like to recognize uh, Carla Fernari and Lynn Pegg, who do a tremendous job um, and keep up with me and make sure that I do my job in putting the program together. Hi, this is Sean. Um, I've been in the Special Olympics since I was a young kid, 16 years old. And then I, I used to be in, in a bowling team in Aiken, and I moved to Asheville, North Carolina. North Carolina. And then I, I grew up since I was a, a baby in 1968. My birthday is November 25th. I have friends from Aiken High. I have friends as my family. And I support my family. And I support my teammates here because I, I, I love them. <laughs> and I want to say, I want to say thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to recognize Susan Paoletti. She, Susan is a volunteer at the program, and she'll be taking our, our contingent of athletes and parents. I think we have about 70 people on the books uh, at the moment down to the state summer games uh, in just a couple weeks. So she's very instrumental in making everything happen as well. All right, thanks everybody.
Anything? Yeah, I want to uh, make a comment. Um, I appreciate Josh and, and the team. I've had an opportunity to attend uh, these events for um, for several years and watch athletes. Had an opportunity to take my grandson over to uh, to play kick. We had a kickball tournament over near the and and, and you you don't want to. Do not underestimate any of these athletes, I can tell you, and do not get in front of them if they're going after a kickball, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> but I uh, had the opportunity with uh, this past, uh, I guess it was about a week ago, to go over to TC and see the, as they said, 500 athletes there and their families. And, and these are these are – these are people that go to my church, go to your church. We just run into them all the time. And I did not know it was that big and, until I become a commissioner. But uh, Commissioner Whitesides and Commissioner uh, Farr was there. And um, I know that Commissioner uh, Frost has been before, too. So, But it was wonderful. And I was glad you all were able to come in and present this work so we could get it on camera and let everybody see. And so they could uh, get out and participate and cheer you guys on and pray for you and attend some of the, the events. And But thank you so much for coming tonight. All right, the next item on our agenda is the public hearing for the Economic Development Coalition appropriation. And Dr. Green will, or Ben Teague, will give us a little bit of background on this, and then we'll have a public hearing. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're good. All right. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate you uh, letting me be here. Max, maybe we could uh, pull up the presentation. Uh, let me just say, uh, also, these are amazing athletes, and I appreciate you letting them be here as well. They're, they're fantastic. So, um, Ben T, Executive Director of the Economic Development Coalition, and uh, uh, kind of per the state statutes, need to have a, a public hearing. Uh, so, I want to start off and just kind of tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, the Economic Development Coalition, we're seven people. Uh, we're a division of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're very proud of our staff for being an accredited economic development organization. It's actually only 53 in the entire world. It's a standard of excellence that we've met, and I'm, I'm proud of them for the job that they've done. But those seven people are divided into four different areas. Uh, that's research, entrepreneurship, uh, recruitment, existing business expansion. Um, but overall, our job is to create good jobs and capital investment to sustain the level of uh, community that we have. So the structure is that the county has a contract with the chamber, and then the chamber staff staffs the Economic Development Coalition board. Uh, and you might have heard of Venture Asheville uh, as, as a brand. It is a sub-brand of the Economic Development Coalition to help uh, connect with entrepreneurs. Why is this important? Uh, because uh, you, as the county go government, get to leverage uh, through the public-private partnership uh, the private sector. Uh, this million dollar budget, uh, there's about a, a third of that comes from government funding, which includes the city and the county, and two thirds of that right now comes from uh, from the private sector. We love for those uh, uh, percentages maybe to balance out just a little bit more, but of that funding, the county has long been a significant partner in Economic Development Coalition. If you see the, the graph here, for decades, this is from 2001 to 2017, uh, the, the county commission has, has been a, a substantial investor in economic development for a long time. The question is, what did we do with that funds, and what kind of return did we provide you for that investment? Uh, so this is a graph, just to, to quickly explain. Uh, the blue is the investment in the EDC over time. You can see uh, 2017 is 300000 there. But the green is the property, direct property taxes paid from our, just our EDC client projects. That is the, the money that is paid. In, and of course, you know, you, you do a $20 million project. It doesn't all happen all at one time. So you had to have some uh, simplicity to the graph, but they continue to pay that over time. So it accumulates. So you can see what that direct property tax investment looks like. There's things that are not included in here, like sales tax, employment tax, those sorts of things. So it's very conservative. Or there's some intangibles that you may not see in this graph uh, that are like, for example, the 3,400 direct jobs over that period of time that those companies hired. And, and then you could do indirect and induce beyond that. 
uh, but that is a very uh, uh, significant um, uh, benefit. So how are we held accountable for our metrics and our return on investment? Every single month, we, I say we run the, the gauntlet of both the EDC board members, which includes uh, Al, there's uh, the, the county commission and past as Commissioner Frost has served on that, uh, but also the chamber board and, and uh, Chairman Newman serves on that. But, but really 60 executives from the community look over our shoulder every single month to say, what are you doing with your budget? What are you doing with your marketing plan? How are you achieving your results that you said that you would achieve? Uh, and then beyond that, we, we do the checkup with the city and the county annually to look at our contract to say, are you doing what you're supposed to do? Um, what are we going to do in the future if, uh, with dollars that you give us? Uh, our AVL 5x5 plan is very spelled out. Uh, our goal is $650 million worth of capital investment, 3,000 direct jobs with a, uh, an added hurdle of an average wage that we're shooting for of $50,000 a year, uh, those, those wages, and then 50 high growth companies where either we will help uh, them find $10 million worth of equity inf uh, investment or through the Asheville Angels, we will invest that in them. Uh, this graphic, not, not necessarily for you to, to pay attention to as much as that we are translating that five-year plan into an annual plan. And so what are we going to do with the money here this next year annually? Uh, these are recruitment efforts, you know, those four different divisions. We're going to be traveling to four different, uh, 12 different markets. Uh, we're going to be going by ourselves and talking to companies directly. We're going to be going with a state, so we're not going to just be in a vacuum. We'll also go and partner with the state to, to, uh, to different shows. And, uh, we'll also go with existing business that are out there to tell that story for us for companies to, to come here with a target of having four different recruitment announcements this next year. Uh, research uh, is the backbone of what we do. Uh, those RFPs of companies looking to find new locations, this is where we get that information from. But also you may see other things out there. Uh, for example, in the Citizen Times, the music impact of uh, what is, how does music impact our economy? We were the ones that quantify that. Cost of living, that is actually us going out there and measuring goods. How much is milk this month? How much is, we are the ones that provide that information. It's not this data ether, but it's really our our efforts that do that and the business planning of small businesses needing information we are really the, the go-to source of information for that existing business and talent uh, development 65 percent of our economic development announcements come from existing companies so we have to have relationships we are very methodical about knocking on their doors and forming relationships when I got to go uh, tour a few uh, with a few of you recently you saw the level of relationships that we have with those companies that are there I will point out our talent development initiative. All of those universities you see highlighted right there are signed on board with what we're doing for help, uh, helping us lead an effort to get college graduates to stay in this market and, and uh, matriculate into the workforce. Uh, Venture Asheville, I told you a little bit about the sub market or the sub brand that's out there aimed at high growth entrepreneurs, uh, particularly just pointing at a, a couple of those. We have 26 different companies in our program right now, but um, Really, if you look at the, the bottom line there, creating a job board for those high growth, high salary jobs, we look to fill 100 of those jobs this next year. Um, here's just a, a few logos of the companies that we've worked with over this last year within Venture Asheville. Um, kind of rounding this out, though, uh, we, we're at a point where we have uh, uh, eaten into our private sector dollars and, and really leaned on them in a very significant way. Uh, we would love to be able to have a return to our 2015 dollars that you see here on the graphic in order to continue to advance our mission in the robust way that we have. So I know that was uh, a lot of information very, very quickly, but if I have any, you have any questions for me, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Uh, any initial questions for Mr. Teague? Uh, otherwise, <coughs> we could have the public hearing, and then if there's any other questions after that, there'll be a chance. I think we're good for now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to open the public hearing on the resolution <coughs> authorizing Buncombe County to make an appropriation for economic development purposes to the Economic Development Coalition for Asheville and Buncombe County. <clears throat> and just for clarity as well, there is a dollar figure in here, but um, we are not necessarily um, bound to that. We're going through our budget process. That number could change. Um, so just because there's a dollar figure in here, that, is, that does not mean that through our budget process that number uh, could not be changed. But um, 
we'll have our public hearing uh, now. So are there any members of the public? I'll open that at um, 535. Any members of the public who would like to speak? Mr. Yelton. <coughs> One of the reasons I don't like to come because you always see questions that never get answered. But that chart really looks good with all those green there of how much money has come back in. I don't envy you all at all because you're looking at a request from them. You're looking at a request from the schools. The fire departments are here tonight requesting that the rates kind of stay the same. And the average property value increased in Buncombe, how much? I think 20%. So you've got to figure out what the tax rate is, taking into account all that money that you spent in the past, all those dollars it brought in on that green chart, right? Because if that green chart doesn't affect the taxpayers of Buncombe County, why would we invest in it? That's why, Brandy, I was serious when I said, I don't envy you all at all, because these are the kind of questions you're going to have to ask through this budget process. And I know that Jupiter Fire Department had a big collapse out there in the bank where an engineer probably didn't do what he was supposed to do, and it cost them a bunch of money. And they pulled it out of their building fund, I understand, from looking at the budget tonight here, just got here. So they're going to need some more money, but you've got to balance all that out. And I'm going to ask you to play Don Yelton just for a while and ask a whole bunch of questions because if all that money spent and all that green up there doesn't help the taxpayer, I'm faced with a 20% increase in my property taxes and I'm trying to provide three affordable houses. Now this is private houses in the country in the middle of a pasture that's renting for $1,000 a month. You try to do that when your property taxes are eight, nine hundred dollars a year, and your insurance is three and four hundred dollars a year just to cover your investment, and you have a renter move out and does five thousand dollars in damage. You try to do it. So just remember, all that green money out there. I didn't see it affect me one bit. Uh, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Don and I really have an exciting life. <laughs> you know, thank God for him anyway. Uh, all these years of experience that I've talked to you young whippersnappers about, I have heard EDC come here many, many times over 30 years. I have yet to see it produce anything except more money for them. I am concerned about several things. Number one, Don touched on some things. It's uh, the taxes. When you live in a county that the hospitals, nonprofits, you don't get no tax base from them. You got schools, no tax base from them. You got your own government here, no tax base from you. And you have EDC coming for money to raise all these multi millions of dollars investment to make things better. I'd like to know why we are getting poorer and poorer with our children and DSS is growing by leaps and bounds if all this investment that we're hearing about you know now who wants to hear negative all the time you don't get enough of slaps on the back and pats on the back of all these things that's coming in here and how good they are three minutes of negativity you can take this but I want you to realize that there's something wrong with this picture when Bob Engel is the highest one in the county for tax bases. And when your food joints become the highest tax base, 
That shows that tourism is doing their job, don't it? So we need to really realize what EDC really is about. If it was producing what it should be producing, we would be lowering our tax property for sure. We wouldn't have the size of government that we have either. So I want you to stop and think about this. This is affecting real people and their lives at the very heart of what we should be trying to do, and that's helping the poor. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing no others, I'm going to close the public hearing at 5.41 p.m. And I don't believe we need to take any action at this time. The requirement tonight was simply to hold the public hearing. Uh, this item, along with others, will be voted on as part of the budget process in June. Uh, thank you, everyone, who was here for this item. And thank, uh, any other questions for Ben before we, uh, before we move on? All right, I think we're good. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Green, is there a county manager's report this evening? Okay, great. All right, uh, moving on uh, to new business. Uh, the uh, first item on new business, we've got three <coughs> items. The first will be a presentation from the fire chiefs, and um, Chief Anthony Penland will be providing an overview for us. And thank you again to all the fire chiefs who are who are with us this evening and has been said before thank you all for your your work in serving the people of buncombe county we appreciate you being with us thank you uh, mr chairman county commissioners we want to thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight we also want to thank you for the service that you show the citizens of buncombe county our reason for being here tonight is it's already been stated is for our tax purposes we had to submit our budgets on April 18th, and we were told that any rate above the revenue neutral rate, we would need to come before the county commissioners. So that is why we are here. The fire chiefs of this county uh, have worked diligently to come up with a uh, thing that has been affecting us for the past 10 years in this county. Uh, Dr. Green has, has gotten uh, copies of them. It looks like she's passed them around. My attempt is to give you an overview of that but my colleagues are here to answer any questions that you may have in regards to their, their individual budgets. We all have a specific drive that drives our budget, okay? But we're all in the same boat. We all collect our, our, our revenues from the same, same area, and we all have to follow the same guidelines. The Fire Service Bunk County is extremely proud to protect the citizens of our county with exceptional service. However, it's been a facing several issues over the past 10 years that significantly impacted the cost of maintaining the levels of service which are expected and have been difficult to maintain. The budget process is never easy. It's never easy, but when you take into consideration all the regulations and requirements that are pushing the fire service, it just adds to that complexity. There are four, uh, four forces that are on from the outside that push our budgets. And I'd like to mention those to you now. The first one is North Carolina Department of Insurance. North Carolina Department of Insurance rates fire departments across this state. They rate you from a class one fire department to a class 10 fire department. Class 10 meaning you are unprotected as insurance. Your fire department does not meet the minimum requirements to be rated in the state, so those citizens pay a class 10 insurance on their premium. One being the best. Doesn't necessarily mean you have the best department, it just means that you have shown the Department of Insurance you have enough equipment, you have enough buildings, they are distributed correctly across your community, and you have reached maintained the, the one rating. Collectively in Buncombe County, and that's the only way we can do it in Buncombe County is to work together. Because we cannot do like the big municipalities across this state and hire a bunch of people and buy a bunch of trucks and put fire stations on every street corner. We can't do that in Buncombe County. So collectively in Buncombe County, we have been able to work together and give an average classification of a five. And you think, well, what does that mean? That means that the insurance premiums in this county are based on a classification five. And over the last 10 years, that's been about a $50 million savings in insurance premiums to our citizens that we serve. Now you think, well, $50 million, you know, that's, that's a pretty big number. 
but it's across the county. So let's go a little bit personal. Let's take my house, for example, in Swannanoa. 2013, the Swannanoa Fire Department was a class five fire department. We were class five slash nine, meaning that any house within a thousand feet of a fire hydrant and within five miles of our face that fire station paid a class five. Anybody outside that thousand feet paid a class nine. 2013, we requested the Department of Insurance come in and inspect us. We lowered our classification down to a class four all across the board. So that means that everybody within five miles of a fire station would pay a class four insurance. My house, well, from a five to a four, I saved $71 in my insurance. So you want a real number? There's, there's the real number. I asked an agent today in Buncombe County to give me an idea of someone who lived in the Long Branch community of Swannanoa who were paying a class nine insurance we went to a class four, what did that represent in savings? He said easily $300. Easily $300 on one house. When I say collectively, I really mean we work together. And nothing more so than last fall in a Broad River community of this county, when we were told that the fire that occurred in Rutherford County had two days before it got to Buncombe County and it arrived in six hours. So what did the Buncombe County Fire Departments do? What we do best. We got together, we went to Broad River, and we saved a bunch of houses. And I'm going to tell you, and if, if I get in trouble for saying this in public, I'm, I'll take the blame. The Forest Service wanted to write off a lot of houses. They were going to take a stand at, Broad, at number nine. We took a stand a lot closer, and we have to let those people that came from out of state know this is our community. We don't just write off people's houses. We're going to do everything we can to save their property. Let's look at another thing. Department of Insurance, National Fire Protection Association. Department of Insurance tells me what I am supposed to have in my community to maintain that class four. The National Fire Protection Association tells me at what standard I have to have that equipment. There's three standards I'm going to talk to you about tonight. The first one is NFPA 1911. NFPA 1911 is a standard on inspection, maintenance, and testing and replacement of in ser uh, emergency service apparatus. NFPA 1710 and 1720, that is a standard on organization and deployment of fire department personnel, which is the two big issues facing our budgets. The third, um, outside agency is OSHA and then the fourth one that we'll talk to you tonight is the North Carolina General Assembly. They have a direct impact on the fire departments across the state but sometimes at no cost. This year could be a little bit different. So some people may say well what does the tax rate have to do with the insurance rate and have to do with standards? Well our revenue stream in the fire departments is the tax rate and we use that revenue to meet the regulations set forth by the Department of Insurance and to try to meet the standards that are set forth by the National Fire Protection Association and this year what the General Assembly may do. NFPA 1911 on apparatus. Chapter 5 of that standard states that any emergency apparatus that does not meet the current safety requirements and those safety requirements are limited to passenger restraint, visibility, EPA uh, requirements, and that list goes on and on. Appendix D of that same standard states that any apparatus does not meet the current standard or is more than 25 years old needs to be replaced. Currently, right now, Buncombe County Fire Departments have $15 million worth of equipment that does not meet the current standard. So I want to know I have two vehicles that are over 30 years old. Now we have prided ourselves in keeping those things running, but now it's coming to a time where they're not that reliable. And they're not sitting in a bay as a reserve. They are actually trying to be used on a day-to-day -day basis. Since the instances county has increased by 73% over the last 10 years, 
That is one call every 11 minutes that a Buncombe County Fire Department responds to. It's important that we replace our equipment. And some of us are way past the time to do so according to the standard. NFPA 1710 and 1720, that is the deployment of emergency personnel. That standard basically says that you will have enough personnel on duty to be able to maintain all the job functions that are required at the scene of a structure fire. And though some of those job functions are not in, are uh, ventilation, fire suppression, rescue, exposure protection. So those are some things that we have to have enough people to do. The perfect scenario in that situation would be just have an all paid fire department. Put 14 people on, a, on a, every shift and you wouldn't have to worry about it. You know what that would cost? No, I'm not here asking you for that, absolutely not, and I will, in my tenure as fire chief, will not ask for that. But you know, the volunteers were the backbone of our organizations. In the Buncombe County scenario here, we try to supplement our paid staff with our volunteers. But unfortunately, over the last 30 years, the National Volunteer Fire Council has reported that the volunteer fire service in the country has declined. While the incidents have tripled, the responses have tripled in the last 30 years. Now there's been an uptick since 2011 volunteer fire service, but not enough to offset the need for the people that we have to. So more and more of the county fire departments are going to paid staff, whether it be a, a full-time or a part-time employee. That has led to over a 116% increase in personnel cost in the last 10 years. In 2006, there was 411 career firefighters in Buncombe County. That number today stands at 512. And we, we do that because we have to meet that standard. We do that because we don't have the people. We do that together because that's the only option we have here in this county. That's why you'll see a Swan and North truck in Black Mountain. You'll see a Riceville truck in Reynolds an Inca truck in Skyland. Sometimes you'll even see a Skyland truck in Swannanoa. That's the only way we can meet those standards. That 116% increase, that's talking about salaries, tax requirements, and retirement for those departments that offer retirement. Not all departments offer the re a retirement. That is not counting the fact that health insurance has went up 125% for Buncombe County Fire Departments in the last 10 years. There is no idea of what's gonna happen in 2018 or the next 10 years. I know that in Swannanoa, our insurance right now, our agent said we're probably looking at about a 30% increase from 17 to 18. So, <clears throat> let's look at one last thing, and that's the North Carolina General Assembly. I've, I told you before that the General Assembly has a direct impact on what the fire departments do across this state, but sometimes it's at no cost. This year, our municipal fire departments and two of our county fire departments, West Buncombe and Skyland, are gonna have a direct cost related to House Bill 340. And House Bill 340 is a separation allowance for firefighters which basically says if a firefighter works 30 years of service, he can retire if he is on local government retirement or state retirement, he can retire at 30 years of service and his employer will pay 85 one hundredths of a percent of his average salary until he reaches the age of 62. Now, that's a separation allowance that law enforcement has had since 1980. This bill was introduced into the House by the Professional Firefighters Association of North Carolina. It passed the House 112 to nothing. Now it sits over in the Senate. Right now it's in the Senate Rules Committee. I'm not sure where it's, it's um, going to move from, this, from there. But if this bill passes, then the municipal fire departments, Black Mountain, Weaverville, Asheville, Skyland, and West Buncombe will be on the hook to pay their firefighters who retire after 30 years of credible service, a separation allowance, they reach age of 62. 
Now, we had a conversation with Dr. Green several months ago, and I had the opportunity to tell her that about the House Bill 340, and she goes, well, I'm glad that we, I don't have any firefighters. But they added EMS workers and fire marshals to that bill. So guess who may be with us? So, so I just want to let you know about that. There's no way in our short time here tonight that I can go over each individual thing. I didn't talk about maintenance of vehicles. I didn't talk about maintenance of buildings. And while some of us are in different seats of this boat we're driving here, we're all on the, in the same boat. We're all, we're all in it together. We've done our best over the last several years to do more with less. That's why you haven't seen us until now. Unfortunately, we are not capable of keeping up with that practice. Some of us have outdated and unreliable equipment. Some of us need to hire and to assist in meeting a standard, and we all have to pay health insurance. I guess you could say that what we want to do is just maintain the services, services that our citizens have grown accustomed to. While we continue to meet the demands placed upon us, the fire departments in this county have provided the citizens with the best service possible, and we are very proud of our accomplishment. But none of those accomplishments could have been possible without the help from each other and without the help of our county commissioners. Like I said in the beginning, my colleagues are here. They represent all 20 of the fire districts in this county, and they'll answer any question you may have for them right now. Thank you, Chief. Questions? Um, so tell me how many, um, I think in a previous meeting, you talked about how many hours um, of, of uh, continuing training in a year a firefighter has to have? Well, according to the Department of Insurance, it's um, a, a 270 <coughs> hours is what um, is the max that you get credit on. And um, so our paid staff that work their, their schedules, I mean, they can pretty much get that. But volunteers, there's, there's just no way. Right now, we don't have any um, places for them to work in our communities. Some of us don't. So those, those volunteer are having to go elsewhere to get jobs. So you go work a 40-hour week job in, in a, another community, and you come back, and we're going to ask you to put 270 hours worth of training and probably about 200 to 300 hours worth of responding to calls, adding 500 more hours to your already busy schedule, that's why you see a decline in the volunteer fire service. So now, does everybody meet that 270? No, no, ma'am, they don't, they don't meet that. We do our best. So we try to put our best, our best foot forward in training. We, all, all departments offer uh, training, and then the state offers a lot of training throughout. We have a great training facility down in Woodfin that we utilize uh, on, on a daily basis so we, we do the best we can and um, about that bill so prior if um, I know it's different like Black Mountain firefighters are state employees uh, but prior to that bill so what you're saying now a firefighter can work for 30 years retire and not have health insurance not have any what, is that right? No, what, what happens is it's different municipalities and different departments may offer their retirees a different package mm -hmm. to leave. I know with the city of Asheville, the city of Asheville used to offer, once they, a, a firefighter retired, they were offered health care. Right. Anybody hired after 2012 does not get that benefit now because this came too, cost, too costly for the city to do that. I'm not sure exactly what Black Mountain <coughs> offers. I do think they offer health care to their employees so they reach um, Medicare uh, right 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 now uh, the, like in, in Swannanoa I, I get to retire when the federal government says it's time for me to retire and right now they set it at 67 so <laughs> got a few years to go but see we're not on that type of retirement so. and don't firefighters have a greater risk of health illnesses oh yes ma'am there is um, I mean, you got to look at it. Fighting fire is that's a dangerous profession. You're going into 1,500 degree heat, carrying a 80 pounds of extra weight on you, and um, and you're going into cancer causing agents. So there's a push now from the NFPA to say that every fire firefighter across this country should have two sets of turnout gear. 
So when they go into a structure fire tonight, that turnout gear comes off, it goes in a washing machine, and they have another set to continue. Well, turnout gear right now costs $3,000 a set. So to buy each firefighter two sets of turnout gear is costly. And that's a part of our, our plan in Swan Oil is just to replace some turnout gear. So, but yes, it is, it's a dangerous job. And that's why that 30-year thing is there. Right. That's why they're trying to entice you as a firefighter to say, we appreciate your 30 years worth of work, but you've done a good deed now. Now it's time to go relax. So. And I just have one other question. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the minimum amount of uh, firefighters that can respond to a call? Is that mandated by the state? It's mandated by uh, NFPA. And they, the, the standard says you need to have enough people on shift that can cover those functions that's, that's needed at the fire scene. And to put a number to it, that's around 14. And so in, like most of our departments average around maybe four employees on shift. Right. And so some other departments may have a little bit more than that. At Swan we have five full-time and we try to supplement with one part-timer. But we, we don't really, tr we can't in a way try to fulfill if people take a day off. So we try to have a minimum staffing of five. Sometimes we'll go to four. But that's why, you know, if we're two calls deep, Swan Oil averages about 15 to 16 overlapping calls a, a, a month. So that means that we're already on one call and we get another call. So we go two to three calls deep. That's why you'll probably see Rossville or Black Mountain coming into our community to help. We just don't have the, the, the personnel to do that. And, and for us to do that, rough numbers, for me to do everything that Department of Insurance requires me to do. They require me to have three engines, two ladder companies, two service trucks, a reserve engine, and to, and to have all those people would be almost, I need to add like $2.3 million to our budget. And, and that's, that's, just, that's just, that's unheard of. We can't, we can't do that. So we'll continue doing it the Buncombe County way, which means <laughs> We'll help each other. Right. But in order to do that, some of us have got to replace some equipment. So some of us have got to hire some people. So. Well, I'm grateful you're all here and doing what you do. Uh, Mr. Fryer. Anthony, <clears throat> Anthony I, I want to thank all of you for what you do. And I understand it's not easy. I did get to speak to some of you. I didn't get to make it to the meeting, but I did get to speak to some of you. And it goes back to the same thing. We're not going, this is not going to be going up on the property tax. This is just going to be property savings, the way I look at it. If it helps save our property, I'll be more than happy to pay $5 more a month, you know, on my fire insurance and in my district. But, uh, or if it's what it is. But if, it, if it's even more, that's the way it is. But I talked to my local fire chief last weekend, and there's areas that he has to have, and you know, especially the pay of the employees that you do have, and trying to keep the employees is hard too. So I I understand, and uh, yeah, I know it's not a vote, but all I know is is I respect what you all of you do, and. It's going to be hard for me to say no to anything that you asked for because <laughs> even the volunteers you used to have a lot of volunteers, and it's you're short there now. But it's uh, I, I don't know what else you could say about it. People that, that go out to save people's lives, save their property. Uh, I don't, it's easy for me. So you know, thanks for what you really guys. Thanks for what all Olivians do. Well, thank you. All right, any other questions? I don't have any questions. I've got, got a comment. Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to be in a lot of your uh, facilities, meet a lot of the young men and women that work with you and, uh, and witness the cooperation. I like the way you said that. I like the Buncombe County way. I, I, uh, I like seeing the cooperation between the uh, uh, between each of the stations, and I've seen it a lot. In, a, in just four years of being a commissioner. And I know it's not easy for you to, to ask what you ask for because of the way you, you, you know, you're the stewardship that you've existed, you know, to date. 
So uh, I've, I've talked to you all about, you know, I, I want to make sure the young men and women, you know, that uh, want to come and stay with you, want to enter into that industry, and, want, and that they can be paid well. And uh, I've had that discussion with all of you. And so that's m my main uh, concern, I guess, is to make sure that we do what we can, you know, for the young men, men and women that are starting and, uh, and, and, and get them to stay in that industry because uh, you, 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 do a great, you do a great work and we appreciate it. And, um, and our, our appreciation is not enough. We don't understand what you do because we don't do it. You know, I'm not going to say I understand what, what you do because I'm, you know, that I'm heading the other direction. You know, when that when that <laughs> gas explosion occurred in, in Inca, but I will never, ever, 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 ever forget that, Mr. Justice and others. I will never forget that. You know, and the cooperation that was had between so many so many people that that will stick stick in my memory. So, it doesn't mean we we don't challenge each other on. You know, on numbers and figures and discussion, we have to do that. But uh, we're so grateful with for what y'all do and uh, and uh, and understand all the top down. You know, most people don't really realize. I've been to I, one of the uh, reasons that NACO exists. You know, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, and I've got to go to that is to keep people from pushing dollars down to the county. But it happens all the time, doesn't it? I mean, you listed four organizations that y'all have to deal with but that's just what we deal with and so that's why it's is always already been said it's not an enviable enviable position to be in but it's it's very easy to do uh, to do the right thing when it comes to this so thank y'all for thank all of y'all for coming tonight I, I have to ask this question what is um, so everybody knows this what's the starting salary for a county firefighter We just we just completed a uh, wage and benefit study th for the county, and right now the average is uh, about twenty seven thousand dollars as a starting pay for a firefighter, which is a little bit more than about nine twenty five an hour. So that's that's what the um, starting salary is for someone who will won't run the other way. They'll run exactly into right. the trouble. So yeah, Boy, that's and you know thing. that's. It's it's a it's it's a risky business that everybody takes, but we got into it because we we, I got into it because I, I I love to help people, I love to serve, and um, I, I have to say I, I mean I'm a, I'm a citizen of Swan Oil, have been all my entire life, and I just enjoy the community, and that's the reason I, I grew up with a lot of people there, and I want to continue to serve them, but we have some it's hard to, recruit, that really good employee, and it's even harder. To hang on to them when you can't offer and keep up the benefits and so that's one of the things that we're faced with is recruiting that employee and also keeping them I lose a lot of people to the city of Asheville only because they have the local government retirement and, and that's a, and it's a good department the city is a, I mean at one point I thought I was a minor league department to the city it seemed like uh, seven eight nine people came to us we trained them they went up to the bigger they went up to the big leagues but um but we work together we also work with the city and we we know that and we're going to lose those people until we can recruit them i'm sorry till we can retain them with the benefits and unfortunately the only way to do that is through our revenue stream and we got to do some fancy um, ideal work and try to make sure we have the right way to fix that we're and willing to do that but and I know no one you all don't do this because of the money but um, I would challenge all of us to work with these folks so by this time next year it's a different because if the paper doesn't print anything about all day to day what firefighters that go into a burning building get paid when they start out mr. chairman yes can I ask one more sure if you don't mind uh, I understand that you know you look at Broad River you look at Garen Creek and you look at you know a couple of areas and at Garen Creek I did talk to them there for quite a while back I would like to see if the county if we could possibly help some of them with grant writing 
to be able to try to get some of the grants because they were having a hard time getting air tanks and stuff in, in Garen's Creek. And they were down to like two uh, packs for their backs. So, uh, you know, if, if there's any way that, that we in the county can possibly help do something like that, I don't know if we can, but Miss Green might know it. And, but uh, if we could, I'd like to see that happen. Well, I'd like to make, um, because you brought up the grants, Buncombe County Fire Departments over the last 10 years has written and received over $11 million worth of grants. Oh, good. And um, the thing is, though, is the grant competition has got so much more competitive that we, we've, we've lost out. I, I, I'm actually waiting on one grant for turnout gear in Swannanoa, but I lost out last year on a turnout, turnout gear grant. To buy apparatus, according to the AFG guidelines, 10% of the AFG funds have to go to apparatus. Well, the AFG is funded at 300 million. So that means that $30 million has to go for apparatus. But think about it, an apparatus is a half a million dollars. So that you're not gonna buy many pieces of apparatus for $30 million and the fact that they had 1,900 applications just in the apparatus acquisition. And I will tell you, and, and to the citizens of this county, we have done everything we can with grant writing to try to offset some of our costs. And right now we just, I didn't, I didn't get one. I think some of the other part, we're all still waiting. There's about three of us that's still waiting on last November's AFG, but and it just, they just started funding it during the third week of that. So who knows, we may hear something. So. Ronnie. Yes, sir. See, I would like to say, um, even though I'm the new kid on the block, I've lived in Buncombe County all my life, and I appreciate what you've done and what you continue to do, and you've taken care of us all these years. Now it's time for us to take care of you. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well said. Chief, thanks very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I really thanks. appreciate it, and we'll move this process forward. Yeah. All right, the next item on the agenda is a presentation from the county schools. Uh, Dr. Tony Baldwin is with us. I see some of the school board members here as well. Thank you all for being here. I see uh, school board member Pat Bryant with us. Pat, thank you for being with us. Thanks for your service on the school board. And the school capital commission. <laughs> At some point in time, you're going to have to learn that word that's, what is this, no? <laughs> yeah. Come out of my mouth Good luck. I, I'm here to present the budget for Buncombe County Schools, and as soon as the last person leaves, um, on behalf of Buncombe County Schools, I, I want to publicly say how important all of those fire departments all those first responders, emergency management, headed up by the legendary Jerry Vihan, are for each and every safe school plan and crisis response in our schools. Those guys are at the table and we do tabletops. They are essential in each of those school districts that they serve. And, um, and, and again, there's just maybe a couple left, but uh, on behalf of Buckham County Schools, I want to just publicly say thank you as well. They are MVPs. I've got nine slides to present our budget, and really the first four are basic budget slides, but I think it's important because, um, you know, I hear speakers a lot talk about various figures on the Buncombe County School budget. Uh, and, and by the way, in reference to, to a previous uh, uh, item that I heard uh, earlier, um, our, our budget is currently built on 24,687 students, and for the past four years, there's 115 school systems in the state of North Carolina, and uh, we rank 13th, and that's the way it's been for those past four years. So just to make sure that, uh, that you understand that we are considered <coughs> one of the largest school systems in the state of North Carolina. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to see from, from the audience, but I think I have I've provided that information in front of you. I thought this was an important slide for you to see because it gives a good comparison 
when we talk about per pupil expenditure uh, and those uh, 24,600 students in Buncombe County, uh, and look, and it's important again to understand our school budget, the particular sources where those funds come from, and how we rank in the state. Um, I do not have 1617 because that year is uh, we still have three more weeks. We are counting them down to graduation, but we do not yet have the figures for this current year because there's still uh, funds that are are being obligated. But I want us to, to focus in on 2015-16 and a comparison of Buncombe County to the state. And when you look at um, uh, the state figures, you'll see that per pupil, $5,665. And that ranks us 87th. Now again, 115 school systems. Um, why that low? Uh, some of that reason is simply the demographics and the size of Buncombe County schools because we may not qualify for state funds for low wealth, uh, low wealth school systems, for example. Um, and uh, when you take a look at the uh, federal, you'll see that uh, per pupil, $534. Uh, we talk a lot about the needs in Buncombe County schools with our exceptional children and especially our Title I and our English language learners. I shared a document that came across with accreditation and that was targeted as one of those areas that we are seeing considerable growth in needs. I think we're averaging per month over the last three years 20 uh, English language learners new to the system coming into Buncombe County Schools. And when you f look at that over a period of time and the support and the needs of those students, that, that's a real focus area for us. But again, that compares to $615 for the state. Um, when you look at local, and uh, this, is, this is why I put this slide in, because I think this is a feel-good slide. Uh, I, I, when I come in and talk about state budget, there's not a lot of feel-good I'm going to give to you. Um, but I think you can feel, uh, feel exceptionally proud about the rank out of 115 school systems, because you can see we rank 20th out of 115 <coughs> systems. And I think that is certainly an indication of the support that uh, these county commissioners have given over a long period of time to really both our school systems, Buncombe County and Asheville City. And then finally, uh, there, are, um, there are funds that, um, uh, th that come in over a uh, uh, j just a miscellaneous type and that ranks us as 71st. And um, again, you can see that uh, uh, in comparison to the state, uh, a little bit higher. Um, again, that ranges from a lot of different needs and, and different pockets of the funding. So I thought that was interesting for you to see. Those are figures over five years, so you can see the various comparisons. But again, if you, if you try to find a positive, the positive is the increase, the improvement in rank with local funding. And that's, uh, that's extremely important for us. Next, and again, this is, uh, as, as I said, when, when people talk about um, Buncombe County school funds and public school funds, um, our source of funding and the percentage of funding is quite different than our sister system in, in the city. We are heavily dependent upon state funds. And, and I'm going to put this point at the forefront again because what it creates when I come to you, um, and I'm sure there are other systems as well as the schools that come to you, there's an issue when the state budget is not complete because we have to play crystal ball and we have to do it to the best of our ability. And as you can see, the source of our fundings, the vast majority of our funds, 67% come from state, 27% come from uh, the commitment from the commissioners in the county, and then 6% federal. Now the only time in, in my tenure that that federal reached double digits is back in 2009-10, uh, and you can recall when uh, the federal funds came in as a part of the stimulus, um, it, it uh, also gave sustainable funds. Uh, that were used. The, the issue, and, and I appreciated the chief referencing federal grants. Um, I, I look at the federal funding as um, sort of the Marines coming in. They come in and we, we just can't shout loud enough that they're here. 
but the issue is always that at some point in time they leave and if there's not uh, equitable funds to sustain the effort and the impact made by those federal funds um, there are issues that are left so uh, again that is six percent I think that ranged again as high as 13 percent back in the 9 10 10 11 this is huge for us to understand our budget because when we start looking at challenges, especially from the state, um, and, and we had one recently. Um, I, I appreciate the county manager, uh, and, I, and I know she probably didn't appreciate me, but uh, I had a hotline because we were staying up to date on the impact of the House bill and Senate bill concerning the K-3 uh, classroom allotment. and. Um, the, the significant changes. So we went from um, a, a law that was in place, ready to come into effect for 1718, that would have required us to hire 45 additional K-3 teachers along with equitable assistance, and we have a ratio K-3 for those assistants. And um, the House bill came in, uh, it mitigated uh, Chuck McGrady from, uh, from Hendersonville uh, led that particular bill. Uh, the Senate, um, thank goodness, finally heard that, and they came in with their compromise. And so as a result, we at least can, can rest knowing that that has been mitigated for one year. So those 45 hires for K-3 teachers uh, have, have now been downsized to seven, along with five assistants. So that is a tremendous relief for 17-18. 18-19, the, the uh, current law that will go into effect in 18-19, that um, original uh, initial law requiring the uh, 45 additional classrooms will be in place for 18-19. Now there's a lot that can happen over a year. And I do believe that there's a lot of uh, very positive discussion going on in both the House and the Senate and I remain very optimistic. But um, as I, again, the fire chief sort of put, put a little warning out there, a little warning bell, uh, I, I will need to do the same. But I will also tell you that we are going to internally take care from a budgetary standpoint, uh, those seven additional hires for classroom teachers, those five additional assistants, and it is in, in going to impact two of our elementary schools with space. Uh, we have a game plan to, uh, uh, to uh, find that relief for those, uh, those two particular schools. 89% of our operating budget is in people and human resources. So after a short period of time of looking for areas to find additional revenue, to find particular cuts to bring in additional revenue, you're into people. And that's what makes our budget, um, to some degree, I think unique when you look across the board. Um, but that's an important, important uh, fact to know about our operating budget. Now again, as I said, I want to put this on the forefront again. It's a timeline issue when we come to you. Uh, the governor's budget, and I think of it, and we, we talk to our staff in terms of there's four models of the state budget. The first one all, is always the governor's budget, and that came out on March the 1st. The second and third is either the House or the Senate. They, they take turns. But the most important component is the fourth model because that's when all three are put in front of those three different organizations and they decide what the final budget is. That's a timeline issue. By state law, I and Asheville City Schools have to bring a budget to you requesting local funds by May 15th. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to extend my uh, visit with you because we didn't even have time once the budget came in from the Senate to present to our own board. Um, and we wanted to make sure that our school board heard our request first. So uh, Senate did approve on May the 11th. So now we have one 
of the two bodies in the General Assembly with a, with a model budget. We have yet to see anything from the House. It could be next week. It could be two to three weeks from now. And then following that, we've got final state budget negotiations to take place. So what I present to you tonight is based upon that governor's budget. Um, we believe that there'll be some in between, but we don't know that. So the best that we can do is come to you. I think that's the, the same thing that Asheville City Schools did. Um, but, but I present it to you as a timeline issue um, because I certainly would not come to you asking for money to, uh, to, to buffer the Buncombe County School budget. Uh, we're doing the best we can in giving you as accurate a numbers as possible. We also have to present our own budget by June the 30th. Um, I can recall uh, my second year superintendent when the final state budget was approved in October. Uh, that's a challenge, again, when you consider the percentage of funds that come from the state budget for operating expenses for Buckham County Schools. I also wanted to give you, again, so that, um, uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Green and I spoke about this, I wanted to give you a comparison so that, that you saw as far as what Buncombe County Schools, the impact of the governor's budget and the Senate budget, and you can see in both uh, salary, because there's increases in both of those budgets for certified staff and for non-certified staff, it's about 136,000 um, with certified, 134,000 with, uh, with classified uh, staff, our teacher assistants, our custodians, our drivers. Um, the health insurance, uh, there's a, a difference, a fairly minimal difference uh, of around $6,000 there. And then the retirement, um, because uh, each year I've come to you the health insurance and the retirement uh, requirements for the employer has, has increased. Uh, th those have, have come, uh, I think every year I've been superintendent and this is my ninth year. Um, there's also been some proposed salary increase that impacted uh, certified and state employees. Thing to keep in mind uh, regarding salary increases, um, and I'll move on to the next slide that uh, 12 to 14 percent of our employees in the Buncombe County school system are paid from local funds. So if the state and in the governor's budget, budget there was a 5 percent increase that was put in place for certified, there was a 3 percent put in place for uh, state employees, non-certified, and um, um, so w when, when that's um, presented, to us from the state in order for those locally paid employees to receive equitable increases, the request comes to you for that. Uh, and again, this, is, uh, this parallels what has come from Asheville City, I think the exact percentage. So the total proposed pay increase is $1,628,452. Next slide is also uh, what we consider continuation because it comes to you every year and that is in terms of the benefit increases and our proposal uh, or uh, what we have seen from the governor's proposal $498,410 for the matching retirement contribution and for the employer paid health insurance $118,305 and that comes to a total of six hundred and sixteen seven hundred and fifteen dollars. Yes, sir. Just a just a quick question, and it may be I just don't understand it. But the employer's matching retirement contribution going up a percent. Why why does that uh, why does that occur? I mean, increasing that uh, amount. And and I'm processing in my mind that. You know where I was with before you had you know a uh, six percent and they matched it, but that was a, that was the four hundred one k. So can you explain it to me? You know, it, well, I wish I could. Yeah, I honestly can't because that's <laughs> dictated by the state. And um, apologize to my finance officer; she could probably come up and explain that to you, uh, Dr. Green. You you probably could give it a good shot. 
I don't mind at all. Uh, if you look, the state portion of the retirement system is actually underfunded at this point. Local government is not. And okay. so this is the effort to move to bring that to full funding. It will take several, several years of more increases to do that. Okay. All right. Thanks. The, the next request fell in the category of uh, maintenance and expansion. Um, we are entering 1718 into the final phase of the Nesbitt Discovery Academy. Uh, I think um, most of the commissioners have had an opportunity to visit uh, that, that campus there on our central office location. And um, that is a, um, it's the early college model. Uh, we have 100 students per grade. We are currently at 300, so they will welcome essentially their senior class. They will have a senior class next year, and they will have all four years. Uh, so with that, just as we open um, a new school, uh, we do have some requests uh, for locally paid uh, teachers. And in this case, uh, it is uh, three core teachers, and our core is English, math, social studies, and science. So we are making that request to complete that uh, faculty and staff. And I will also tell you that uh, we're proud of every single school, every one of our 42 schools in Buncombe County. And uh, I was so happy to share that accreditation report because that was an external team that came in. Um, but if you've not had an opportunity to visit Nesbitt Discovery and see some of the best practices that are taking place there, and I know our EDC was here, and they were significant in terms of planning that because the intent was to make a clear connection between STEM education and workforce development. And so if you've had, not had an opportunity, I'd love to, to take you through that facility. Also, uh, we have a program called Compassionate Schools. Uh, several of you have, have had presentations on that. David Thompson, our Student Services Director, it's a national model. And we are becoming a model for the nation, by the way. Um, I, I know a lot of issues come to you as commissioners, a lot of issues regarding community health that impact families, specifically impact our kids. Resiliency training, that starts in kindergarten and the power of that, the power to give them strength to overcome some of the challenges that are, uh, in, in some cases, environmental. Uh, that's, that's at the core of that program. And so we received uh, a fairly significant federal grant. And once again, um, when it came into, uh, came into Buncombe County Schools, it was um, accepted a lot of professional development across all of our schools, uh, staffing, and in particular, we were able to put four elementary school counselors um, fully, fully uh, embedded in the Compassionate Schools model. And I will tell you, I wish I'd brought uh, some of our elementary principals, but they would attest to you how important that has been for their school and their school community, not just for those kids, but the impact it's made on the entire community. So. We're asking help. That is one of those situations where the funds have, have run out and we just don't have uh, adequate funding to sustain them, but we believe it's important. And we also believe that it uh, connects extremely well with the mission uh, of, this, of, of, of this Board of Commissioners. And finally, the uh, new math textbook adoption. Um, every time I've come here, I get the question about textbooks. Uh, I think you get a lot of questions about textbooks. Reality of it is, since 2009 10, it's been hot, cold in terms of state funds for textbooks, for instructional supplies. One year we have it, one year we don't. We are in catch up mode, and that's everybody across the state. And um, this is crucial. These particular math textbooks will be aimed at the upper elementaries. Um, and so we're, we're asking for help there. Uh, they are very much, very much needed. The total of that comes to $691,000. And so if I total um, our request to you uh, on the continuation, $2,245,167, the proposed increase uh, of expansion that I just went over, $691,000, and year two of the certified local supplement. And, um, I, you know, I've, I've thought about how to, how to present this. Um, I was at a function 
about, well, it was now about four and a half hours ago. But we had all 41 of our schools represented at the central office. And each one of those schools had their principal and had their newly designated teacher of the year. Had opportunity to speak with them. And if there was one theme that came out, because I, I said in my opening remarks that I'm, uh, I've got a full day today and it's going to be late into the night because I'm presenting to the commissioners regarding our budget, it was a significant thank you for the decision that was made and the commitment for these uh, for this supplement increase. Um, it's challenging out there. As much as we love Asheville, as much as people that don't live in Asheville love Asheville, it's tough to recruit, especially in areas such as math and science, special education. And it's beginning to become a challenge even at the elementary level. And why? Because the pool of candidates that are going into the teaching field when you look across the state at the university system been a decrease in about 30 percent so it's competitive uh, now we've got a great brand we got a great brand of school we got a great brand in terms of an environment uh, our teacher housing we're very proud of that's going to be i think a wonderful incentive um, but this is important and I will promise you as superintendent when when I'm I'm interviewing especially for those uh, school leaders it is extremely important um, so again we're requesting uh, that final phase I know you have a lot of requests coming your way and you have a lot of incredible public servants that uh, that, that have uh, have needs as well but I can tell you that again from that from that entire group that was a that was something that they wanted to make sure that I said to you publicly on behalf of them so that concludes my presentation. Certainly for any questions I could, I could answer. All right, Dr. Baldwin, thank you very much. And uh, as you noted, this is gonna be a um, kind of an iterative process as we look at how the state process goes. So I'm sure this will not be, I'm sure we're gonna continue to wanna dialogue with you as these numbers get firmed up from the state and what it means for us. But thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Dr. Baldwin, just one quick question. Thank you very much to your, for the presentation and all the incredible work happening. Um, as this grant period winds down for the Compassionate Schools program, uh, at, is it possible to get some additional information about what you all have learned during the grant term so that we can Absolutely. Be aware of that? And I would really like if uh, I know your agendas are, are, are very filled, but I would love to have a small team come in and present it because I think this, this goes hand in hand with what you're seeing with, uh, with Mandy's department and Health and Human Services. And, um, but I can, I can certainly provide figures to you on that. Um, this is staffing and this is what we had because it's recurring a good chunk of those funds went for professional development so we're able to carry that on yeah, that would be great thank Sounds you like there's a lot of interest in that yeah, yeah. thank you hey, commissioners other questions at this time no. all right again thank you dr. Baldwin uh, for being here and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation as we move forward in the budget process so um, the final item under new business for this evening is the Solar Farm Memorandum of Understanding with Duke Energy. And I see that we have uh, Jason Walls with us from Duke Energy. And I hope that that uh, scout that is still with us gets some kind of special badge for staying at the okay. County Commission meeting this long. So thank you both for, for, for sticking with us. Um, I, I think I'd just like to say a few words if Jason uh, has anything to add. Um, I'd welcome that too. And, um, and also just before I say more I did pass out a copy of a, a hard copy of the memorandum of understanding there was one uh, proposed change to it that was brought up after the memorandum was on the county website so I wanted everyone to have a hard copy of that so we can we can look at that and I'll speak to that in just a minute but just I guess just a little bit of context here so since the County Commission approved uh, the idea of moving forward with a solar farm project at the retired county landfill in Woodfin. Uh, Duke Energy has uh, been engaging with the county around the idea of partnering with us on this project. Uh, so I think I'd just like to sort of summarize what the Memorandum of Understanding uh, contemplates. 
essentially Duke Energy would like to partner with the county on the development of this project. Uh, Duke Energy will provide 100% of the funds necessary to develop the project and to study the feasibility of the project. As you will all recall at our meeting where we discussed this uh, project, we did appropriate, I think it was $27,000 right. to pay for the feasibility studies uh, for the project. Duke Energy uh, has offered to pay all of those costs, so that $27,000 or $27,500 uh, will not be needed from the county. Uh, assuming the feasibility studies uh, are positive, Duke would also provide 100% of the funding to actually construct the project and Duke would be responsible for operating uh, the solar energy asset. Uh, this memorandum of understanding is, n is a non-binding agreement between the two parties. In essence, it's an agreement to move the process forward to again study the feasibility, confirm it is a viable location, if for any reason the county or Duke Energy decided that it is not a good fit for them, either party could uh, discontinue the project at any time. And the one change that um, I'd like to bring everyone's attention to, and uh, this goes to the question that Mr. Yelton spoke to, uh, in the con I think one of the concerns he expressed at the beginning of the meeting, and our friends at the Asheville Citizen Times also had the same question. There was, there was uh, in the original, um, in the original MOU, um, provision number five discusses basically protecting confidential information either party might have. And the question came up though that really aren't all documents related to this project that are circulated between the parties. Uh, they really should be public information and, and uh, Jason and Duke Energy quickly chimed in that that is, that is their expectation and their understanding and I think that's the way we see it as well. So. So we replaced um, provision number five, which was originally titled restrictions on the provision of information, and replaced it with a section, and I'll just read it for the record. Um, so uh, it's called compliance with North Carolina public records laws, and it states any and all documents, papers, letters, maps, books, photographs, films, sound recordings, magnetic or other tapes, electronic data processing records, artifacts or other documentary material regardless of physical form or characteristics made or received pursuant to this agreement shall be subject to chapter 132 of the North Carolina General Statutes which I assume is the public records requirements for local government <coughs> and um, so I guess I would just I would just add you know I think that um, I think it's exciting that Duke wants to partner with the county on this project um, there's a lot of great energy companies in the state, a lot of companies doing these kind of projects. Uh, you know, building a solar, a solar project on a retired landfill does present uh, unusual complications and is a little bit more expensive than, than a typical site. And I think um, Duke Energy is very committed to the project, assuming the feasibility comes back positive. They have the funding uh, already approved to uh, construct the project. So. I think that the county can have a very high level of confidence that if the feasibility studies come back positive, that partnering with Duke um, provides a pathway to get this project uh, to be successful. So for all those reasons, I think it's a good, a good approach, and that's why we've brought it back for discussion this evening. Uh, Jason, would you like to add anything at this time? Um, again, J I'm Jason Walls, district manager with Duke, and you have to apologize to me. I'm normally not dressed this way. <laughs> Excuse this me, I don't, one I don't think I'm you're I'm actually pulling double duty at a commissioner meeting. So yeah, I don't think you're Jason Walls. I, don't <laughs> yeah. well, I even have a name tag. Okay, okay. So if, um, if not, I'll have my son attest to that. Yeah. But anyway, so it is, kind of, it is an exciting time. As you will recall, as part of kind of the um, ongoing um, work of the Western Carolina's modernization project, the company has a commitment to build at least 15 megawatts of solar. Um, and we were delighted to, um, to kind of do some initial study and, and understanding of the opportunity to um, potentially partner with the county on the, um, the landfill in Woodfin. Again, there's a lot of feasibility, a lot of study still left to do, but this MOU is really, um, it's a non-binding way, but it's a very formal way of saying we want to take our partnership a little 
little bit further and explore um, what needs to happen to move the project forward. So we're delighted to be a partner, um, and we look forward to kind of continuing this conversation forward. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that folks may have. Commissioner Fryer. Uh, this goes this, this goes back a little ways, and Mr. Creighton, uh, you talked to some of the gentlemen back November in that area. Uh, what, what's been brought up through that situation? Are you talking with the Duke representatives? The Duke representatives, yes. Visited the site. They did a preliminary layout on just what they thought that they, as far as where the solar panels could go, and that was basically done from an aerial. Uh, visited the site that's pretty much what has happened up until now but but the discussions have been going on with them for there has been some yes sir and uh, Jason mr. Yelton did bring up some things say 30 years down the road Duke is a good company and I understand that personally but if solar panels die what do we do with them that's a, that's a that's a very good question and you know, how did we dispose of them, or, or do we m make sure that Duke handles it? Because, uh, you know, some other companies could come in here, but they could possibly walk away and just leave, leave the county stuck. And I don't think, personally, I don't think Duke could do that. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about the heritage and the history of our company, we have a, over a century of service in the Carolinas um, of serving our communities and lifting our communities up. And so um, we're going to be a company that does the right thing every step of the way from, um, from the analysis to the installation to um, the life cycle or whatever of, of the solar panels. And once we get through the MOU phase and if the county does vote to move forward with this more formal conversation around the project, you know, all those terms and conditions will be discussed as part of, you know, turning an MOU and a discussion into a formal contract and actual project. And so those are questions that are probably better asked as the process continues and the analysis and that continued work um, evolves on this project. Thank you. Right. My, uh, my expectation is that this, this MOU would be replaced eventually by an actual site lease agreement between the two parties. But that would certainly address the requirements to remove the equipment at the end of the project life. Well, the, the 27000 that automatically takes that away because I think they know where the substation is <laughs> if they put it in. <laughs> they, still have to, they still have to follow this study process, though, too. So. And, and, in, and just kind of to that, an interesting part is even though it's inside the company, we still have to do the same level of rigor and analysis on the system as if it were a private developer. Right. Uh, just a couple of questions um, around process since we last, uh, or since we voted to move forward to feasibility. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the rationale for initiating an MOU before we have the results of the feasibility study and wonder if we could get some comment from both the county perspective and Duke's perspective on why we would uh, why wouldn't wouldn't wait to have the definitive results of a feasibility study before entering into the next stage? I'll take a crack at it and then feel free sure. to chime in. So I think a couple of things. First, uh, we do save the you know the cost of having to pay for that feasibility study if we go forward with this process. Then Duke will Duke will um, pay those uh, costs. So there is there's a, there's an upfront cost savings. And then really, you know, with that being the only. Um, significant item that the county was anticipating any development cost on this approach does allow the um, this project to be developed at no cost to taxpayers which is which is nice so um, and the, I guess the other thing I would just say is um, you know I, I do think that I do think that that partnering with Duke is a good solution for the project and I guess for that reason, I just don't see a reason to not go ahead and and acknowledge that and um, and plan on plan on working with them on the project. So so I guess I just don't see a reason to not do it. I guess is my is my is my answer. But it's a it's a fair it's a fair question. Jason, do you have any and, thoughts, and Commissioner? If um, it, and it, you know, looked at it another way, you know, this is a way, a very formal way, and this is something that the company has entered into on a number of different um, instances on projects across both this state and South Carolina and other places. It's really just a formal way of the two parties saying, we want to go to the next level in, in kind of our partnership to share information about, you know, the site or the size and different things to understand and really to make sure that both our ratepayers and the taxpayers um, are protected, uh, you know, as we 
continue to move forward. So the MOU being non-binding allows either party to really walk away. But what it um, it also kind of it's a signal that the county um, that the county does it, and well the county as a whole, meaning all of their elected leaders have voted to say we do want to take this partnership to that next level of feasibility of understanding and of study because once we move past that the company will start spending that 27,000 or whatever those dollars are to study the feasibility of this site and so it's just really a step in the process to ensure that both parties have looked each other in the eye have signed on a dotted line to say yeah we want to continue this partnership and explore this to the next step to I the guess, next I guess level. one other just one other thought I would I would add in as well Although again, within the context that this is a non-binding agreement, so you know uh, nothing nothing ties either side's hands here. You know, my experience working on these kind of projects is that you know you have all this due diligence you have to do, and for sites that you know that survive that process, m one of the other key um, ingredients to a project is of course getting a dedicated getting a finance partner for a project. So the fact that uh, Duke is here and uh, is willing to com you know again. In the in a in the non-binding uh, non-binding legal sense, but essentially commit to funding the project, assuming that it all goes uh, the due diligence goes well. Um, I think is uh, um, it's it's good to to have a committed funding partner at at this stage of the project. So that's another reason I think it's an attractive decision to go ahead and make at this time. The only, the only last thing I'll add is to one of the points about the applicable laws in South Carolina to the point that we've done this a lot, that was just a typo because we have um, executed these kind of MOUs multiple times that, you know, and so the word from South Carolina should have been changed to North Carolina, but quite frankly, we missed that typo when we sent it over. So it's, I think. Do you want it to be North Carolina? I think so. Okay, we'll make it, we'll make it North Carolina, and if, assuming there's a motion. Um, other questions, Commissioner? Um, has there been conversation with any other potential, potential uh, financer of the project, or has there been any sort of open process through which, this is partly for folks who, well, we don't have a full house right now, but <laughs> in, in spirit, in theory, there are folks following this conversation yep. along, and the last time we That's talked right. about this, we voted to approve a feasibility study. Mm -hmm. There was some discussion that mm -hmm. there might be an opportunity for some of that money to be refunded, and then I just want to make sure we're narrating sort sure. of what's happened between now and then. Um, the full extent possible for folks. So have, I guess it's a yeah. question of the county is have there been, uh, has there been dialogue or conversation with any other entity or party who's interested in this project? Sure, so I'll just, I'll speak to that. And again, I think, um, as we talked about this before, but I do, I, you know, I do work in the solar industry. So I happen to know some of the other uh, companies and the leadership of those companies. And there certainly are, you know, North Carolina, um, has become the second largest solar market in the United States over the last several years. And uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of these solar farm projects happening across our state, mostly, you know, in the Piedmont and the eastern part of the state where there's a lot more flat land and, and pretty cheap land. So um, as I've said from the beginning, of course, any company that I'm involved in would not participate in any way uh, in the development of the project. But I did reach out to a couple of the uh, leaders of some of the other companies that have a lot of experience and qualifications uh, to see if there, you know, to see if there was interest in in this, and to, and to kind of have a conversation about it, and I would say that there, are, you know, there are some other companies that said, sure, you know, we'd be happy to happy to talk about it. You know, these companies are always looking for you know business development opportunities. So, um, but from my perspective, um, none of them, um, none of them are in, are in the same position that Duke is to offer the kind of proposal that um, is before us today to fully, uh, you know, to fund all the development costs of the project, and that already has committed uh, internal funding that they could actually construct the project. I, I think one of the concerns, um, one of the concerns about our site compared to, you know, all the other projects across the state that, again, are not on landfills and don't have some of the unique, unique uh, hurdles that the pro a project on a landfill will have to come is that if we were, you know, working with a different partner, I think there's a, there's a certain risk that a, a year or 18 months down the road, once all the feasibility studies done, a project like ours might appear to be relatively less attractive than other business opportunities that they might have. So, um, for all those different reasons, I think I think um, for this particular project, uh, ch uh, choosing to pursue the development process with with Duke is a is a good solution. I, I have 
I mean, I think, you know, from the first time we went out there, I thought it was a good idea, but I appreciate your questions, Jasmine, because I, you know, Brownie knows companies, but I think going forward, we want to be really clear how we do business. And, um, I mean, everybody's all for this, but and for transparent, I feel like we've crossed first base and skipped all the other bases and now we're rounding for home and um, it, it just gives the appearance to me a little and I'm all for the project but from the outside looking in it looks like a very closed up smug deal already done but, and you know I'm just putting that out there I am supportive of it but I think going forward in process we have to remember what we did here when we approach other things I'm just making those comments to counter what Jasmine, you know, agree, you know, with, I think it's good that you ask those questions. Other comments? Yeah. Uh, do you yield to Commissioner Belcher? Are you finished? Oh, I'm done. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah. I sound like Tim Moffat there for a minute, didn't I? <laughs> um, and that was a compliment to Mr. Moffat if he's listening. So, uh, I've got, I've got a, I got a few qu questions, and uh, I want to say that uh, with Duke being part of this, that I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that partnership. Um, I've got some questions about the agreement, and so um, I want to try. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to take a stab at some of these things. I think some good questions have been asked. Um, one is, uh, who wrote the agreement? Did we write the agreement, staff, or did Duke? Yeah, who wrote the agreement? Nobody's asked that. I'm gonna ask that question. Who wrote the agreement? So it was a it, it came from Duke initially, but it, okay. there must have been ten. It, or, there were there was some you know it was just some you know sharing comments back and forth. Type so normal you know which that happens a lot you know. But but you initiated the agreement. It started because you've done this before. So and there's been one mention about that the South Carolina and North Carolina that that's that's an error. And we're also wanting to add a paragraph to cover the the concerns uh, the open meeting laws and the concerns of that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions about some of the other concerns because they are, they are good. Um, and this might be more appropriate for another, certainly another company besides Duke, but would, would you um, just tell us what you know about the, the solar panels, what's in them, you know, what's hazardous, the, 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 you know, the getting rid of them and disposal and that, I mean, do you have, or, or am I, or did I just, did I just Mr. go Brush, out you of your league? Yeah, yeah. So, that, uh, yeah, from a, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not the technical expert on what's in a solar panel and those types of things. Okay. So I, it's not appropriate for me to answer that question. Okay, so, but I could, I, I, w I would assume based on Duke's record that, uh, there's plenty of policies in place to take care of that in, a, in a proper manner. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to think if if uh, if any of these questions might be um, for you. I don't think I see anything else that would be for for you. So thank you, thank you, Jason. Uh, I um, have a couple of questions. That, the, this is a memorandum of understanding, but when we do a lease, will that come back and be presented public? Um, I'm assuming. Will there be a public hearing uh, for us to do the contract here? Come back on the agenda for us, us, mm -hmm. us to do that. Um, also, uh, I, I would like to see, and I might make an, um, whenever, Everybody gets done. I might be ready to make a motion and a, an amendment to them because it's going to have to be amended anyhow because of the the original. Okay. Did we bring, did we did we add addition uh, paragraph the striking of paragraph five? Did we add that in the pre-session? Is that what we did? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Belcher, thank you. If I might, uh, Max has uh, he can can you put it up, Max? New number five. There we go. Perfect. So if there's a new, uh, just to summarize, if there's a, excuse me, this replaces and simplifies the language of previous paragraph five. 
it's not a bait and switch. I just want everyone to understand that the county was and always will be subject to the public records law. This just that uh, Commissioner Newman's uh, suggestion just makes it simple and more to the point, but it still does the same thing. So if there's a motion of, of, of it would be to replace what's number five now on the agenda with this paragraph right. five and as well to put in North Carolina as venue uh, as uh, Jason suggested. Okay. And so um, I would like to suggest that and uh, under number three might be the best place to put it that um, the public be notified about uh, about meetings I don't I don't see where that would be a problem about under three under item number three what meetings well it says um, uh, if there's meetings between yeah but yeah well the um, you know there are there are obligations for public meeting for public meetings I mean are you thinking of something different from that not really I guess you know this is going to move forward our staff their staff are going to talk about various things those are not all public meetings right. some of those are just phone calls or getting together so those would not all trigger public meeting requirements when the lease comes back to be discussed here of course that'll be a that requires so right we have the whole state statutes around requirements for public meetings when they are triggered okay so I'll, I'll just was you gonna to speak to that mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure yes sir I can't yeah I just want to make sure I just want to make sure the public is is notified sure there's a, there was a question a few minutes ago about whether or not when this comes back if it comes back if the parties decide to move forward with a more formal agreement then yes it'd have to come okay. back before this board if it's a lease or a license for more than 10 years then yes it has to come back before this board for a public hearing the purpose of this paragraph 3 is just really to have a point of contact for talking about this feasibility study between Duke Energy personnel and, and John Creighton and anyone else in the, with the county government. It's not for meetings per se, public meetings, it's just for communications and process. Okay, okay. And, I, and I think, you know, of course, uh, paragraph 14, you know, is, is very clear. It can be terminated any time by either party, you know, and so the, the, the risk there uh, I don't see uh, see a lot of I, I'm grateful for the discussion this evening I think that it's very very important that the public understand clearly what we're doing and what we're not doing and um, and I think that I'm uh, uh, I'm ready to make a make a can motion I, can I ask you our can? attorney a question so if so are we obligated if we enter into this agreement to to work with Duke I would say no I would no, say Duke may not want to even do it after Turn but on. yes speak I can't hear oh I'm sorry <laughs> I would say uh, neither party is obligated to work with each other I mean if after Duke does the feasibility uh, study they decide they don't you know they don't want to do it because there's some issues which arise from that they're not obligated to work with us and I would say likewise and also all this will be as it says uh, public records because it's not about litigation so other uh, potential vendors if they uh, see that the deals going uh, forward they might make an offer that the, you know which uh, the uh, the, uh, the Commission might want to to uh, accept or or they might want to you know consider to address your uh, your question about the process this is just the uh, how big entities uh, deal with each other through MOUs or uh, through letters of intent because the uh, the Commission might have a different composition you know when the thing finally comes up uh, or uh, you know Duke Power might have a different representative this just states what the people are intending now but they're not committed on the next phase the way I see it thank you so I'm ready to make a motion can you pull up the paragraph, paragraph five? Pull it back up. So um, I'll make a motion of approval with the addition of paragraph five and with the addition of paragraph five to replace paragraph five that was uh, on, the, on the agenda and the change of 
uh, South Carolina to North Carolina under um, item number 11. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll make I'll second. I'll second. All right, Mr. Whiteside, you got it. Further discussion? Uh, I just I want to share I'm not averse to being in this dialogue with Duke. I'm can see the potential here, but I, uh, I'm going to vote against this because I do have concerns that the process has been rushed and I have concerns about the language in Section 2. Um, I'd be very open to being an ongoing conversation and dialogue, uh, but I just think we owe it to, the, to really um, be thorough and transparent about every step of this process. Um, so my concerns rest with process at this point rather than uh, the proposal that's in the air. So just want to clarify that that's why I'll be voting no. All right. Further comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Uh, please raise your hand if you voted no. All right. Great. So four to three. All right. It's approved on a vote of four to three. And we'll move on to the next item. It, it is a public hearing. It was a, well, I did say we would take public comment. I'm sorry. I, I made a mistake, it. Jerry. Um, we have already voted. Chair, yes, sir. I would like to make a public comment. I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. Go ahead. I want to say to you, and thank you, Chairman. I called you Chairman, didn't call you Brownie. How about that? I appreciate the fact of what you said. And if everything that you all had said had been said in the original proposal, I wouldn't have been here. So I think that tells me that when you start negotiating contracts, you might need to get away from the attorneys and get away from the automatic printer thing at Duke. And I'm having fun with you, Jason, okay? Because it's gonna be hard to put that on the landfill because it's unstable. One thing, do remember this. Please put the panels high enough you can mow underneath with a lawnmower. Don't do what Biltmore did and put them so close to the ground you gotta do it with a weed eater, okay? God, yes. Uh, and bottom line is, I wanna thank you all for considering this and discussing it. But I wanna suggest that you might ought to get a rebel once in a while to read because Commissioner Frost you're right when you read it it sounded like you were putting a wall around the process and I think that's never been the intention by anything that was said here but the way it was written that expressed that and that would have been pointed out to you all for free if you just have passed it by me because all I've asked for since day one what was it Commissioner Whiteside, openness, honesty, and transparency. So I thank you all for doing that. All right. Um, Mr. Rice, go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the board. Thank you, Mr. Ferrara. For your comment and Ellen thank you for your I think you women are a little more detailed than the men are and I thank you for that a good woman keeps any man in line uh, I have a concern that the process is screwed up here at the last meeting my understanding was we were going to look into it this meeting everything went forward and we're ready to do something I think it's a dead Jim sneaky way of uh, pulling progress energy into a deal here and I think there's something bigger to this than just what we're hearing today this is too fast this is not the right way to do business and you men ought to stick up and do the right thing and and pull this off and start this process again whenever you have uh, a feasibility study you ought to isolate it let it be a feasibility <coughs> study without an MOE involved because you know what? 
you might have a finer use for it than a solar panel that'll bring in a lot more money somewhere or another if you had a feasibility study to find out what's going on first. Joe, out there in Inca, look at the ball field out there on that hump of uh, a landfill out there. What's the best use out there? My God, we got our children playing on the ball field already in June of 2018. If it's going to bring in this kind of money in Inca, why in the name of God, Joe, didn't you offer the uh, proposal for this to be a ball field out there? What's one ball field against another on a landfill? You're using two standards and not looking at it the same way here. We got millionaires out there on the ball field at Inca. We got multi billions on this one. What, what are we doing? What are we thinking? I think there's something bigger because you're getting Duke involved. I think this is a sneaky way of doing something and it'll come out. I smell a rat and you women are on to something if you'll just stick with it. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, um, we are, th oh, sure, go ahead. Hey, public health, well, here we go. <laughs> um, I never ever do this, but uh, since this is like my professional capacity, I did want to kind of say what our concern was. Um, we were worried that if we, in the original Clause 5, that if we had to request public information, that Duke would then be the person who we um, wound up doing like a legal, um, uh, request with um, and so that was our concern it's been totally taken out of the new MOU and I actually just wanted to say that I appreciate having an MOU as a journalist because uh, the alternative would be that like I would then wait a year for the feasibility study to come out to know what you were doing so um, from the perspective of the press I hope that um, having um, such exciting public comment about such a document does not discourage you from doing it in the future no. because we really do no. like to see this level of transparency from the county and we hope you will do it all the time. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for thank you has for reading that in your, your has comments. That and you broke the fourth wall. Yeah. Just, yeah I don't yeah. think that's ever happened. It's never happened. No. It's awesome. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks everyone for your for your comments on this. All right, we're through our new business items for the evening. On June 6th at 5 p.m., the County Board of Commissioners will have their regular meeting and public hearing on the fiscal year 18 budget here at 200 College Street, room 326. We've got a board appointment. Randy, board appointment. Randy Flack. Yeah, I'm going to nominate right. Randy Flack for the Board of Adjustment. All right, is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 aye.